Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Goddess Project podcast. Today, we have a really, really, I have a really exciting show for you, I think. <laughs> I hope that you will agree. Today, we're going to be talking about Inanna Ishtar. Now, I have been hesitating on putting together something for Inanna Ishtar because there's just so much of it. And I thought to myself, oh my God. And also because so much of it has already been said. And so I wanted to give you an episode in which, of course, we talk about the things that have been said to some degree, but also perhaps um, I would give you, as always, my personal perspective, my sort of learned perspective on it and, and see what you think. So if you are new to the Goddess Project podcast, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I welcome all of you that have joined me recently, especially some of you that have joined me from uh, Neil's podcast, uh, Gnostic Informant. Neil is a genius and uh, I enjoy working with him so, so much. And I hope that we we get to do something for you guys in the future as well. And for those of you that have been with me from the beginning, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to me talk. Sometimes you know, um, doing a podcast is a little bit, I mean, it is a solitary endeavor. And I was saying to my students a couple of days ago, the reason why I started this podcast is because I teach in courses that are very structured um, of, a, of a, a variety of disciplines in humanities. And so I don't always get to expand or share or kind of bring up ideas or theories in my class because there's, they're very structured and we have to follow a curriculum that I, I have set up to be fair, but um, I want them to sort of complete that learning. And so sometimes we do get talking about goddesses in the ancient, well, often we do get talking about goddesses in the ancient world, and we don't have a lot of time to really enjoy those discussions. And I realized as I was saying to them, I said, you know, this is why I did the podcast episodes, because it gives me some time to sort of unravel my thoughts and share some of the research and have some discussions and in a really informal way in a way that I hope, I hope this doesn't feel like a classroom, I guess is what I'm saying. I hope that it feels like a sharing of some information and then a sharing of sort of opinions based on that, so, you know, what we would call educated opinions, blah, blah. And so I really hope that that's how you feel when you're listening to this podcast. And I, I want to also give a shout out to all of you that have sent messages to me that comment that share this podcast, of course, all of you that subscribe to it, because like I said, sometimes you feel like you're in a bit of a void. You're a bit in an in abyss. You're very isolated when, when I'm putting this together. I don't have like a partner on the show where we could be sort of talking back and forth. That, if I did, that might take a few hours. <laughs> um, although I do have an exciting interview coming up uh, for you guys. Uh Mm, I have to figure out when I'm going to put that together with Karina Kylo, who wrote a book called uh, The Woman Who Married the Bear, who I absolutely love. And I've been asked to review and uh, submit a review for publication on that book. So I'm just waiting for all that to come together. And then I'm going to share with you my interview with her, a fascinating, fascinating scholar. Anyways, I digress. So, so, so often this is very much an isolated uh, endeavor. And so I really enjoy when you guys are sending me messages and just letting me know that you're listening and that you're enjoying it. And again, we don't have to agree with everything. And I'm not doing this to preach to anyone or change your mind about your own beliefs. Um, but I am doing this to share my thoughts on things and, uh, and hopefully also have a little bit of, of fun with it. So without further ado, Let's get into Inanna Ishtar. I've named this episode of Inanna Ishtar. If you're watching me on YouTube, you can sort of see the images. If you're listening on Spotify, that's okay. I will describe to you the images. And you know, actually, side note on that, um, finding images of Inanna is a little bit, I don't want to say difficult, but there are images of Inanna that are very clear, and I'm going to use some of those, and you could Google Inanna anytime that you like, because the same images that I'm using will come up for you. But um, 
they differ in many ways. And so I find that really fascinating and, and frustrating. Actually, that's one of the goals of my, one of my future goals is to travel to the museums around the world and take pictures of image of artifacts of all of the goddess that I talked about and, and share them with you all. I mean, I do some of that on TikTok and I do some of that on Instagram, but, um, one of the challenges, of course, is funding, <laughs> finding funding to travel and go to museums and take uh, pictures and share them um, is is the challenges, as many of you probably already know. Um, and so uh, if there's any uh, wealthy benefactor out there that would like to support the Artemis Center, please get in contact with me uh, because I would love to document more of the artifacts that are in museums and in places that many of us, you know, can't reach even in, in a lifetime because there are so many. And so this summer that's coming up, I do have a plan and I'm kind of like saving up every penny to spend like four months of the summer term in Europe and go to specific museums and find different artifacts and photograph them so that when I'm searching for an image of a divinity, I know that there are so many more images than what we have available on Google, you know? Um, and I would really like to see them, photograph them, and also share them with you guys. Um, and so I named this um, episode, She Who Wants All the Things, because one of the things that I think about Inanna, when I think about Inanna, and I know some of you Inanna followers may not agree, um, is I see her as a woman who wants everything. Uh, she is a, a woman, a goddess. She is a goddess who wants everything. And a goddess who takes everything. Also, I kind of sometimes see her as a goddess that th throws tantrums, which gods and goddesses throw tantrums a lot. But when she does that, obviously, lots of people die. And so in many ways, she reminds me of Artemis, as we'll see, because there is a, a fierceness about her, uh, a sense of confidence about her that is undeniable, you know, in the sense that if you don't give her, if her father doesn't give her something, if Gilgamesh doesn't give her something, if somebody doesn't give her something, she just destroys, she just annihil annihilates, annihilates, um, you know, the city, the town, the country, the space, she just destroys everything in her anger and feels no remorse about it. And I don't want to say that that's a positive or negative thing, but I do want to say that among women, especially that has become a rare thing because female rage is something that's often discouraged. And so I think that for me, for Artemis, that's the thing that really um, pulls me to her is her ability to just have no ducks to give, you know, um, and Inanna is the same. And of course, Inanna predates Artemis, we think. Um, much of what archaeologists and anthropologists and scholars document is limited. Um, and that will be one of the discussions for today because we really, I mean, for Inanna, we do have more texts. And I guess for Artemis, we have lots of texts, but I don't know that we have enough texts to really understand the, the, the complete context of ancient Sumeria, ancient Acadia, even ancient Greece we have a very limited perspective, often male, often patriarchal, but it's more than that. It's it's very specific to a town or a village. And so, yes, it's a clue. It's like when you have a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, we have lots of pieces, but we don't have a complete jigsaw puzzle. And so if I gave you that and I said to you, here's the puzzle, you'd say to me, but but this is incomplete. Like, what is this, right? Um, however, we don't think about that in history, right? So lots of people sometimes come in my comments and they'll be like, well, A and B did this and C did that. And, that. and I'm like, well, that depends on the interpretation, the timing, what came before that, who inspired that. Um, so what I would recommend is that you hold your historical facts, and I say that in quotation marks, very loosely, Um 
very loosely because while we have some evidence, primary source, it is interpreted with a modern view. And so I'm going to talk about the Jungian interpretation of Inanna's descent, because I think it's something that we don't talk about enough, not in goddess circles and uh, perhaps not even among historian circles. And so that's something that I would like for us to talk about. But let's begin by talking about who is Inanna and why does she want all the things? Yeah. So Inanna, of course, is a Sumerian goddess. Ishtar is her Akkadian name. There are numerous documentations of her names, both in Sumerian and later on in Akkadian as Ishtar. There are excellent expert scholars. So if you're into names and the tradition of names, um, I suggest that that is something that you want to look up because um, the names of gods are multiplex. Multiplex. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know what I mean, yeah. She's one of the most important um, deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon. She is often referred to as the goddess of sexual sex and loves. And so she's often associated with Aphrodite and Venus later on in the Greco world. But she is equally a goddess of warfare. So for my two cents, I think that she really embodies sexuality in the sense that, as we will see, she has no boundaries as to how much she loves herself and her body and sex which is wonderful um and but as a goddess of war she is more than the way we think about athena as a goddess of war um we think about athena as a goddess of war because she is the sort of emblem of the athenians who go to war in short but inanna is a goddess who starts wars, who fights wars, who kills people, and um, hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, and 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 doesn't actually use a human male army is what I'm saying. Um, she doesn't lead a human male army. She devastates entire cities and entire worlds. Uh, she's also associated with political power, the underworld. Well, we're going to talk about her descent into the underworld. And of course, she evolves over time. So she's such an influential, powerful divinity. Her images, as we'll talk about in her symbols, are something that is continuously um, evolving, appropriated, assimilated by other goddesses throughout the Mesopotamia, throughout Mesopotamia. We see her transfer or evolve into the Akkadian Ishtar. We see her um, become Astarte. We then see her associated, like I said, with Aphrodite and Venus. Um, Modern day pagans and goddess worshippers see her as a divine, divine feminine empowerment. And, and that is absolutely a fit for her. Um, one could argue she's one of the ultimate uh, embodiments of divine fe feminine empowerment. Um, what does her family tree look like? Her family tree is a little bit um, interesting because, as you can imagine, there's so many diverse traditions. Excuse me. So the family tree of uh, Inanna Ishtar has a few different traditions. She is uh, the daughter of Anu or the daughter of Nana Sin and his wife Ningal. She is the twin sister of Utu Sama. So we're going to talk a little bit about her and Utu and this twinship of brother and sister similar to Artemis Apollo. Or sometimes she's also the daughter of Enki or Ia. Her sister is Ereshkigal. I can't wait to get into Ereshkigal because so much fun. Um, and she does not have really a permanent spouse, but we are going to talk about her interesting marriage slash relationships with Dumuzi or Tammuz, um, whom she eventually condemns to death. She's sometimes also paired with the god Zababa. Um, so she has, you can imagine because of the widespread worship that people implanted her into their own, um, into their own pantheons. Uh, in the Assyrian Empire, Ishtar of Nineveh and Ishtar of Arabella are treated as two different goddesses. Um, and there's this uh, scholarship that talks about how there were many Ishtaris in the ancient world. And this word sometimes um, embodies, you know, goddesses, powerful goddesses. Um, and so you'll see that there is a lot of mm, connection between Ishtar and other divine goddesses. Um, sometimes Ishtar is also the spouse of Asur, and this, she's sometimes known by an alternative name called Mulilitu, which we'll see leads into the Lilitu 
which eventually leads into Lilith. So we're going to talk a little bit about that kind of um, complexity. There's a lot of complexity, complexity around Inanna, but I don't want to dig too far. I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction because there is lots and lots and lots of um, layers. So I think if we focus on a few specific aspects that are most popularly worshipped and most popularly discussed, um, we can maybe get a greater sense of Inanna's worship. Yeah. So in Sumerian poetry, she was often portrayed as a young, innocent girl. Um, some people say that she was sort of under the influence of patriarchy. This is because she often goes to her father or brother or other men in the pantheon or gods in the pantheon asking them for things. And I agree to that interpretation. However, she always gets what she wants. Yeah. And in fact, if she ever does not get what she wants, um, she she demolishes entire towns. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what scholars view her as. I've got a couple of scholars here that I really admire that I thought that I would uh, quote. So Sylvia Brighton Pereira says, although Inanna has two sons and the kings and people of Sumer are called her offspring, she is not a figure in the sense we understand. Like the goddess Artemis, she belongs to that intermediate region, halfway between the state of a mother and that of a virgin, a region full of joie de vivre, so whatever she wants to do, and an appetite for murder, fecu fecundity, 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 mm. and anim animality. Wow. Um, she represents the quintessence of a young girl in what she has of positive, sensual, ferocious, dynamic virgin. But she's never a peaceful housewife nor a mother subjected to the law of the father. She keeps her independence and her magnetism, whether she's in love, newly married, or a widow. I absolutely love this by Brenton Pereira because it really does connect the things that we were just talking about in the sense that here we have a divinity that is both sexual, parental, and wild, and violent, and um, rebellious. Uh, Tikva Freimer Freimer Kensky who is an incredible scholar. I encourage you to pick up her book. Uh, adopts a different kind of view. Uh, she adopts a very feminist and gender perspective view. She says, Inanna represents the undomesticated woman. She embodies all the fear and fascination that such a woman arouse, arouses. Yeah. So Inanna is a woman in a man's life, right? Um, which makes her fundamentally different from other women and which places her on the borderline that marks the differences between men and women. She also, as we'll talk about, transcends gender polarities and is said to transform men into women and women into men. The cult of Inanna attests to her role as the one who blurs the gender boundaries. So this is something I think that is very unique to Inanna and something that we must discuss because her ability to transform gender and her priests and her worshipers um, transforming their gender att attest to the fact, of course, that non-binary experience is as old as time. You know, Inanna's worship can be traced back to five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years ago. It depends on um, how far back you want to go. And this was something that was celebrated and not only celebrated, but the realm of the gods. And so, again, I think in the seriousness of the movements that are happening in North America against uh, trans people and LGBTQ people, I cannot say enough how important learning history and opening our minds to the fact that the way we live now is not the only way to live um, or the longest way to live or the most righteous way to live um, is very important. So um, lastly, I wanted to talk about Johanna Stuckey. Johanna Stuckey is a feminist writer that I absolutely adore um, and I know personally, and she wrote lots of book books on um, ancient goddess worship and is a pioneer in the field. 
she talks about Inanna, she takes up a similar point of view as uh, Tikva Freimer Kensky uh, when she uses the word frontier to describe uh, Inanna's ambivalence. She says, Inanna is on the frontier of full femininity. Inanna was a woman, a goddess, I want to say, because sometimes when we call Inanna a woman, we forget that these are deities, that neither Artemis, neither Inanna, neither any of the goddesses in the pantheons were humans. Anyways, sorry, that's my own little rant. So Inanna was a goddess who behaved like a man and basically lived the same existence as young men, exulting in combat and constantly seeking new sexual experiences. That I agree with. Uh, moreover, Mesopotamian texts usually refer to her as the woman. Even And even when she warriors, she remains a woman. And so once again, we have a divinity that embodies what we today call the feminine and masculine. Uh, don't forget that what is the feminine and masculine as a duality, as a category, as a split between the two is also a human invention. Um, and, you know, I don't want to put my finger on when this was invented because lots of scholars will give you lots of theories of, of when um, gender roles were assigned. Uh, but my point is that it was not always like this. Humans did not live gender roles for all of our 100,000 years plus existence. Gender roles are a modern, and by modern, I mean two, 3,000 years, 5,000 years at best. Gender roles are a patriarchal, the system of patriarchy created gender roles in order to be successful in their conquest of, you know, the the uh, all the other political systems that were in place. So, it's not a surprise then that goddesses and gods can, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they are, they are non-binary, they're fluid because in their time, when their stories are written, gender is fluid. Um, it's sort of, you know, when Inanna, for example, was ruling supreme, gender was still fluid. And as we move forward in time, we see a more restrictive, more frigid, more structured push, forced push on separating those gender roles. By the time we get to the Greeks and by the time we get to the Romans, oh my gosh, uh, we are really um, enforcing repeatedly those gender roles. And even today, as many of you know, gender roles just don't fit. They don't fit cis people. They don't fit anyone. And that's non-cis people. They don't fit. Um, very few people really fit in there and say, oh, yes, I identify with this solely and supremely. Most people are a blend. Um, that's the human existence. So anyways, that's my little rant. Let's talk about the gifts. So Inanna loves and wants things. Remember, I've told you that she wants things. I really love this, this Warka vase, which is about 3000 BCE. So it's about 5000 years old. Um, it's got this beautiful, it's this long vase, long circular vase. And what you see is, in short, people bringing Inanna gifts. So they bring goats, they bring fruits, there are lions, there are every animal, you know, that you can think of is here. Well, in Mesopotamia, there's no polar bears or anything like that. Um, and then at the top, you see a priest offering Inanna a cornucopia, which is, of course, a symbol of wealth and uh, fertility and all of those things. And this vase, the Warka vase, it really, W-A-R-K-A vase, really embodies um, the story of the theft, so supposedly the theft of the divine powers by Inanna from Enki. I don't know if you've all heard of this Sumerian text, um, but I'm going to sum it up. So, um, and, and it really blends into this idea that she wants all the gifts, that she wants all the things. Um, so the story goes like this. So Inanna uh, is invited. Yeah, uh, she's first of all, she stands. She, she, the story begins with her standing in front of a mirror, admiring herself, particularly admiring the beauty of her private of her genitals. Yeah. And so in her text, it's really fascinating because she stands there and is like looking, talking to her vagina, really, and saying, look at this beautiful vagina that I have. Um which I just find so, 
you know, it reminds me of that trend that was going around. I don't know if some of you were old enough to remember it, but uh, when they used to tell you as a, when I was younger, my, my teen, not younger, but you know, uh, 18 to 25, there was this trend going around that you should take a mirror and stick a mirror down between your legs and look at yourself and say to yourself how much you admire your genitals. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that um, for women, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't speak for men and whether or not men stand in the mirror admiring themselves. Perhaps they do. You guys will have to tell me. But uh, for women, this really brought um, up the point that women don't look at their genitals, that women don't like their genitals, um, that we are taught a very, um, I know, thanks to porn, we are taught a very sort of sterile, uh, <laughs> I don't know how this conversation became quite this graphic, but uh, we're taught a really sort of sterile, I don't know, a cosmetic, uh, I don't know the word for it, sort of um, image of our genitals. And if, if your genitals don't fit that, that is sort of the repeated in porn uh, and, and pornographic magazines or pornographic videos. If yours doesn't look like that, I think a lot of women are feel shameful. And the reason why I'm going into that, I, I don't have that in my notes, didn't see that coming. But anyways, um, as you know, this, this, this podcast is not edited. <laughs> I refuse to edit it um, because uh, we're having a conversation. So, uh, and also because I don't like uh, editing. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. So the reason why that is the case, the reason why this is important is because that, um, that confidence and admiration for your own body, particularly um, the pleasure center of females' bodies or one of them, is powerful. And I think this is why a lot of pagans and goddess, modern goddess worshipers uh, are drawn to Inanna and her um, confidence. And so we we start the story by her standing in the mirror, admiring her, the beauty of her genitals. Um, and she's like, you know what? Um, I, I think this is great, but I would like uh, to go visit Enki and ask him a few more things about, you know, how genitals work and how I could increase my pleasure. I'm summarizing for you guys. Please feel free to go look up the original. There's lots of versions online uh, of Inanna and Enki. So she decides to go ask Enki for some um, advice about sex. Now, the god of wisdom, Enki, sees her coming. So he can already see that she's she, he has like a prophecy of her coming. She, he foresees her visit and orders his servants and everybody to give Inanna, you know, the highest welcome, to uh, host her in the best way. He extends all of his hospitality. Anyway, he has a banquet, blah, blah, blah. But they start drinking and he gets drunk and he drinks too much. Okay. And he volunteers to give Inanna divine powers and the essence of all things. He volunteers this. I do want to make this clear because the story sometimes is called the theft of divine powers by Inanna, but actually she doesn't steal anything. She's really invited for dinner He's getting drunk, uh, perhaps in an attempt to impress her, who knows. And he gives her all of these divine powers and the essence of all things. And she says, thanks. You know, she makes a list of all the things that she's received them. She loads them on her ships and she sits back. She sails back to Uruk, which is um, her city. However, as soon as she leaves the port, Anki becomes himself again. So he sobers up. I guess, and is aware that he has been thoughtless and he wants to recover everything he has given her. I mean, come on, talk about a terrible first date, right? Um, and the Enki sends the god Is Isimund, Isimud on a mission to ask Inanna to return the gifts that she was given, okay? Um, and there's all this back and forth, back and forth. So we come up to like six times, I think, that Inanna... Um, with the aid of her, um, of uh, Ninshabur, who is her, I don't know, handmaid, her best friend. Uh, lots, Ninshabur is someone that is often with Inanna. 
People describe her in different ways, uh, some kind of a helper, often a handmaid, et cetera. But she, Ninshibur is also a magician, and she's actually a powerful figure in her own right. I'm not sure that we talk about her enough. So uh, six times Inanna manages to prevent the monsters that are sent by Enki to take back his um, the gifts that he gave her, right? Uh, she finally reaches Uruk, where she's welcomed joyfully. Uh, and en Enki is still pissed off that now. So now he's getting angry. I mean, I can't even with Enki because like, dude, you, you caused your own issues. Um, and sends his herald to Uruk with a list saying, you've taken all these goods from me. Okay. Inanna doesn't care. Inanna gets home to Uruk. Everyone is happy. She renames all the city districts. She assures her people of all the benefits that will result from the fact that now she has all the divine power and at this point, Enki has no choice but to give up and uh, accept the loss and understand that Uruk is going to be the greatest city that ever was. Yeah. So in this case, um, Inanna, I, I, I don't know if one would say she got lucky in the sense that she went to go have a discussion with Enki and have dinner. And he ended up giving her literally everything he had. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was then able to fight off uh, his wanting things in return and become successful. So as a result of all of this, she she often has, um, let's talk a little bit about her symbols and her symbols of power because, because she has everything and because she is a goddess that is sort of unbound by anything, she has such a variety of images and symbols um so for and she has you know four seven thousand years of um semitic history in which the gods and goddesses of that time are absorbed into inanna's um worship so one could argue that inanna is a syncretic goddess she is a goddess that uh, at a certain time in Sumer, absorbed all these pre-Sumer Semitic goddesses' gifts. So that story really, I think, explains why she's just so unlimitless, why she has so much um, of everything. Yeah. So she's often represented in the earliest, for example, um, images that we find she is ep uh, represented by a reed bundle or a gate post so we're going to talk about reeds and we're going to talk a little bit about trees um she is also represented by trees um she is often in anthropomorphic form anthropomorphic form so in the beginning the argument is that she was non-bodied let's say non-bodied uh however as uh God started to be represented in bodies, human bodies. Uh, Inanna Ishtar then begun, begins to be represented fully nude, of course. Um, in Syrian iconography, she sometimes reveals herself with an open cape. She has an open cape. Um, there's lots of nude females in ancient Near Eastern art. And so um, not all of them re represent Inanna Ishtar, but a very, very popular um, representation is of a nude female. Um, she has often has a horned cap on her head. Um, in her warrior aspect, Inanna Ishtar has a robe with weapons coming out of her shoulders, uh, at least a, a weapon in her hand often. She sometimes has a beard to emphasize that masculine side that I said, that non-binary aspect of her. Um, she sometimes is represented as a lion or stands on a lion. Uh, sometimes she has her foot up on a lion or her foot up on a goat or a deer. So again, this kind of um, representation of her standing on the backs of animals is an old ancient representation of power. Uh, she's often compared to a roaring, fearsome lion. Uh, in her astral aspect, the Inanna Ishtar is symbolized by the eight-pointed star. Um she is, she, her color is often red. Let me see if I have that. No, I couldn't find that. So if you go into my, uh, into the Goddess Project Instagram account, you will see when I was at the British Museum, I came up uh, on this piece of uh, Inanna Ishtar Ereshkigal slash Lilith. Okay. 
Uh, some of you are probably really familiar with it. I've posted it in the last couple of weeks and previously many, many times uh, where she stands on the back of lions with her owl feet. She's got wings. Uh, she's got two owls on the side. She's got the horn cap on and uh, she's holding her hand out. Um, and there's lots been lots of debate uh, both on YouTube, well, mostly on, on, on the YouTube channel about whether or not this is Lilith. And so I, and I don't want to be here for too long in this discussion because we did have these debates on in the comments on YouTube. But the the association of this image with Lilith has to do with the association of this image as Erishkigal, uh, the queen of the underworld, and then how that story makes it in, th you know, is repeated over time or adapted over time to represent Erishkigal or a demonness of the underworld. And then as uh, we get into the Hebrew Bible text and the story of Genesis and all that kind of stuff, we get into Lilith. And so Lilith then becomes associated with Erishkigal. And so this image, this very piece uh, becomes the representation of Lilith. Um, and so there's always this debate and this huge debate on this video about who this is. Now, the British Museum identifies this as Inanna Ishtar. The uh, other archaeologists have identified this image as Erishkigal. And many other scholars, pagans, goddess worshippers associate this image with Lilith. And what I mean by that is that one image can be all the things because the image itself has no inscription of who it is. And so, and you know, it's 5,000 years old. So, and it's not in its original colors. Now the British Museum, as I said, I've posted a picture on my IG, has a little picture beside it that has it in full color and polychromy of the past. And it is all red, black, and white. So in its red form, if we are to take that as a fact, then that would be an Inanna Ishtar symbol. And because Inanna goes down into the underworld, there is a tradition, of course, a long tradition that she embodies Ereshkigal. Um, but, and she could, this image could be both Inanna and Ereshkigal because ancient peoples may have understood the layers of a symbol or a piece of art and may have just seen the piece of art and understood the story. I think in our modern world, we get very, very attached to specifics. And so this is what I think sparks the debates online, which I enjoy very much. I'm not opposed, and I don't want you to feel that you can't share your thoughts. I enjoy the um, the debates, the back and forth, as long as they're, of course, respectful and and, and somewhat gentle to each other. You don't, you don't want to get into brawls over it. But um, no one knows. Let me let me be very blunt. No one knows who specifically this image is of. I will argue that it's probably not of Lilith per se until later because uh, Lilith is um, a later development, uh, a little a later adaptation. However, Lilith embodies much of these the aspects of this image, the characteristics of this image. So when we think about Inanna and later Ishtar, and then Ereshkigal. Um, there is much synchronism, syncretism there, much syncretism there. And later goddesses also adapt and become and can be related to the same image. But to be very clear, no one knows exactly who is in this image. We are just going by what we know from, you know, of course, it's an educated uh, guess. So, I really love this image. I think it's a really powerful image. It's actually a really small piece of um, of a little sculpture. I didn't expect it to be quite so small. We have other representations of Inanna uh, where she doesn't have wings. We have other representations where she's fully clothed. We have other rep uh, representations of her where she's wearing all of her weapons. And so um, images can be sort of inter interrelated to one another. Uh, so her colors, her the colors that often represent her are red, sometimes blue, and of course lapis lazuli is one of the colors. Um, some scholars say that red and blue are her colors because they might associate her feminine and masculine. Again, this is a very modern interpretation of um, male and female categories. 
Um, she could represent both, for example, red often represents life and death and blue sometimes represents, you know, the, the sky, the cosmos, et cetera, the, the eternal. So she could really just represent those two things. I don't know that they need to be gendered. Um, she, she sometimes has axes, spears, um, much of her rituals were represented in blood. So there's blood there was blood offerings, blood sacrifices in the Warwick vase. There's lots of animals that are being brought up to be sacrificed uh, to her. Um, often the men that uh, and women that come bearing gifts for Inanna come naked. Um, and like I said, they bring rams and goats, um, bowls full of fruits and wine, lots of wine. Um, and so, and of course, lots of wealth is brought to her you know, crowns of gold, other other symbols of power are brought to her. So I don't know that we can say that she has a particular, um, a singular characteristic or symbol. I would say that because she is such a massively complex divinity, she really has it all. She really, I, I, I can't think of a thing that you could bring to Inanna in the sense of an animal to sacrifice, a fruit to give, uh, a drink to offer, um, um, a piece of jewelry, a piece of clothing. There is really nothing you can offer her that she would say, no, that's not my thing. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's very imp important that we understand that she wants it all and that she has it all and that that's that's the reason why this podcast is she wants it all and she has it all. <laughs> so let's talk about the twins. Yeah. I absolutely love this uh, image here. If you're on uh, YouTube or even if you're on Spotify. So there's this image of um, Utu and Inanna. Inanna is fully clothed and she's got these weapons coming out of her back and Utu standing in front of her. Um, and he's half, well, no, he's kind of dressed and he has his beard and everything. Um, Utu's foot is on a human who is kind of under Inanna's, uh, dress as well. And she's got like a, some men that are chained on a leash behind her and she's holding on to this plant. Um, and he's also holding on to what looks to me like a plant. Some people might think this is a whip. Um, and there are people, so they're standing on like a, a floor, let's say, and underneath there's other humans chained. So there's this idea of holding earthlings under their feet or holding them as their prisoners. And these two are such a powerhouse. I mean, of course, Inanna, I would argue, is is is, is a more, much more massive powerhouse than Utu, um, as is Artemis, in my argument, compared to Apollo. But um, what's really fascinating is the fact that they are depicted facing each other, that they are considered twins, which is really interesting. So the, this idea of the um, two halves of one whole, um, the sharing of a womb, the sharing of um, the cosmos, and the fact that they have humans on like literally on a chokehold, or in the case of Utu, he is uh, standing on top of humans. And so this really tells us the way, this really shows us the way that ancient Sumerians, let's say at this point, um, saw the, what's the word I'm looking for? They saw the position of the gods, that they had a very clear understanding that although the gods had similar, similar, I say in quotation, experiences as humans in the fact that in the sense that they loved, they lost, they were sometimes defeated, um, things got stolen from them or, you know, this kind of, so they had this kind of human experience, but the gods often were, um, always were actually above the, um, the uh, humans. Um, now, and so imagine the cult of Inanna was worshipped for about four millennia, you know, four thousand years plus. Um, and this is not a surprise that this divinity is seen as ruling over places like Uruk, Sumer, Babylon, Akkadia, and Assyria, all that kind of thing. And later as Ishtar, uh, she ruled over Phoenicia. And then later as Astarte, she ruled um, sorry, over Phoenicia there, Assyria, Ishtar, and eventually in Greece is Aphrodite and in Rome is Venus. So 
the power of this goddess who stands above men, all the, all the images in this image, all the figures in this image that are human are men, which is fascinating to me, um, is so powerful that it it crosses millennium. Yeah? So um, the relationship between Utu and Inanna is kind of interesting. And I want to say that it's mostly friendly. Um, I would say it's actually as friendly as, uh, well, no, I don't know if I would say it's as friendly as Apollo and Artemis, only because um, Apollo tends to be very jealous and, and um, well, maybe I just don't like him very much, but um, yeah, he's very possessive. Where Utu and Inanna, I would argue, and others of you can share maybe what you think, but I don't see Utu as someone that is very possessive of Inanna. In fact, I see him as someone that is a little bit more like, uh, this is my sister, and he's sometimes like annoyed with her, but often, you know, collaborates with her. Um, there is this really fantastic story of her asking Utu about sex um, and how she's trying to learn about sex. And um, she goes to him, which I find interesting. So Utu is sitting in a bar in a tavern. So there's this story, right? Uh, there's this piece um, of a story that says that Utu is sitting in a bar, he's sitting in a tavern um, and he's drinking um, beer. He's drinking beer and he's got either some kind of fruits or some kind of grains in front of or some kind of herbs. Depends on the, the, the different um, translations of the story. Anyways, uh, Inanna walks into this bar or into this tavern um, and he gives her a beer. And she um, says, listen, I think that I would like to come with you to your cedar mountain. And I think that this is where I will I will pick up the fruits or the herbs that will teach me about womanly acts of copulating, such as kissing and intercourse. And he's like, what are you talking about? You know, no, like, don't come with me. And we see that Inanna kind of pleads uh, with him and he's like, okay, fine. And then she eats the fruit or the herb and the cedar of his mountain. Okay. And she learns the knowledge about sex and intimacy and intercourse. So there's this really interesting piece. Um, it's a bit of a short story and you can find sort of little blurbs of it and you can find some of its primary source, which is really butchered. The story is a little bit butchered. We're missing some pieces, but it's a fascinating little story. So she goes, she meets him at a, at a she meets him at a bar, her brother. And it's an interesting um, concept that she asks him, for these herbs or these fruits which are on his mountain and that these will teach him teach her about sexual intercourse and this really for me uh connects later on um to the story of eve adam and eve and the eating of fruits to know uh to know more and so i'd like to dive a little bit into um the story of inanna and gilgamesh uh and then the story of the tree and the fruit of knowledge uh, and see how that connects. Um, one of the things, so I think many of us who know the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh know about the tumultuous relationship or the, the terrible relationship between um, Gilgamesh and Inanna. And so while, what do you call it? While Gilgamesh is on his travels, um, Inan, Inanna is trying to seduce him, actually. Let's get to the, the bull of heaven story. Let's do that one first. Um, actually, no, let's do this, the bull for the, the other story that most people don't know. And then we'll get to the popular story. There is a story on the 12th tablet in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, which is sort of attached to the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's a later story. Uh, it's a less known story about Inanna and the Hulupu tree. And Gilgamesh is a part of it, which is really fascinating because um, Gilgamesh and Inanna don't get along. So I'm going to tell you the story of the Hulubu tree first, and then we'll look at uh, their relationship in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, this story between her, uh, Gilgamesh and Inanna, takes place at the very beginning of the world's creation. So the heavens and earth have been separated, uh, and upon the banks of the Euphrates, 
Euphrates, yeah, Euphrates River, a certain tree um, is found. And this tree is called the Hulupu tree, whose species has not yet been identified. So this is a fantastical tree. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of images, but you could Google the Hulupu tree and it is not a real tree. That is not a tree that we can find, but it's a tree that actually makes it into mythology um, often. So Inanna walks around this new world. Uh, she has arrived as a sort of young divinity and she sees this tree and she falls in love with this tree. She says, it's so pretty. And she says, I shall bring this tree to Uruk, her city, and I shall plant this tree in my holy garden. So Inanna takes this tree. She puts it in a garden. Interesting. She cares for the tree with her hand. She settled the earth around the tree with her foot. And she wonders to herself, how long will it be until I have a shining throne to sit upon from this tree, from the wood of this tree? How long will it be until I have a shining bed to lie upon? Okay. And so here we have a creation story that I argue predates Adam and Eve by at least a couple of thousand years, in which a tree is placed in a garden by a goddess alone. And the purpose of this special tree for her as a divinity is that she will make it into a throne or a bed. But the, continu the trees continue to grow for many years. And in though Inanna waits, the tree does not bear fruit or does not bear the fruit that Inanna desire. Instead, it births these three fearsome beasts. A serpent who could not be charmed made its nest in the roots of the hulupu tree. Notice serpent, not snake. And we've talked about in previous episodes how serpent often also, after a long and complex discussion, can be dragon, okay? Or at least snake with legs, yeah? The anzu bird set his young in the branches of the tree and the dark maid Lilith built her home in the trunk. Another association between Lilith and Inanna, okay? So again, we go back to that piece of that artifact in the museum, um, multi-layered meaning in one piece of artifact. So what does Inanna do with these three um, creatures that have come into her hulupu tree, this magical tree um, that she is waiting to bear fruit? And so the, then Inanna begins to laugh and to weep. And oh my God, how she would laugh and weep. Yeah. And she would say to herself, why won't they leave the tree so that the tree can, can uh, bear fruit? And then she begins to be really sad. And in her grief and her horror, she calls her brother Utu to come to her aid, but he does not. And this way he may be like Apollo. Gilgamesh, on the other hand, pff, randomness, Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, does come and does help. He enters her garden. Now, I don't know if this is a, has dual meaning or not, but he enters her garden and chops down the hulupu tree, striking the serpent down, causing the anzu bird to flee with his children and sending Lilith to the wild places. Then he forges for her the gifts she desires. From the trunk of the tree, he carved a throne for his holy sister. So here there's a sort of, relationship. From the trunk of the tree, Gilgamesh carves a bed for Inanna. And in doing so, Gilgamesh leaves. So like this story, even though it's a very little known story and it's a random story, and many uh, scholars believe that it post dates, that it is after the Epic of Gilgamesh and that it is added on there uh, later on. Uh, the, 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 the interesting aspect is that Inanna has a tree, perhaps a tree of knowledge, I don't know, a supernatural tree from which the serpent that ends up in the Garden of Eden comes, from which Lilith that ends up being Adam's first wife comes and the Anzu bird uh, is also there with his children. And so all of these creatures come out of this tree and Inanna seems to be um, unhappy with it and need, want somebody to come and fix it. And so Gilgamesh out of nowhere comes in and he sends them all away. Yeah, Perhaps then they go into the garden of Eve of Yahweh, another God. Um, and then he leaves. 
he leaves uh, Inanna. And a lot of people are like, oh, this is weird that he leaves Inanna and he doesn't do anything with her or anything like that. But I, I think the point of this, and many scholars have argued that um, in this story, Gilgamesh is just a helpful guide. He is not, um, he's not like the man savior, you know, because actually Inanna doesn't need to be saved. She needs to be served here. Um, she is not afraid for her life. The creatures in the tree are not threatening her. They're more like an, an annoyance. And she needs a servant. So she calls her brother, as many sisters do call their brothers, to be like, hey, come do this for me. Uh, and Gilgamesh is not is not a love interest. He's not an equal to her. He's certainly not a consort to her. Um, he is a servant in the garden. Um, in that way, one can compare him a little bit to Adam, but to me, Adam is such a doofus in the Garden of Eden story. He knows nothing. And he, he continues to be a doofus with Lilith and later on with Eve and da, da, da. So I would say that Gilgamesh here is a, a strong male supporter slash servant, right? So he walks in, he helps her figure out what he does for her, what she needs done. And then he leaves because she's fine on her own. Yeah, she just wanted somebody to make her bed and her throne. Um, and this relationship is um, this idea that that show, that uh, that um, the goddess requires help, but that that help is not um, equal does not equal marriage or does not equal a relationship is. Um, Something maybe that we don't discuss as much. We tend, especially in our modern world, when we have man saviors, man saviors come into films or stories, uh, they end up, you know, marrying or becoming lovers, or there's some, there's something, there's some kind of a, there's some kind of a payment for the man hero or the man savior. Um, and this is a fantastic story because Gilgamesh neither demands nor expects nor receives any payment. He just helped her with what she needed help with, and then he leaves. Um, which is a really fantastic story. However, this story is in in a fascinating opposition to the um, antagonism that we are more familiar with in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the killing of the Bull of Heaven. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is sort of um, right before, I mean, give or take, um, the descent of Inanna into uh, the underworld. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu have just killed the demon Humbaba, uh, and they find themselves, uh, they go off into the cedar forest, and uh, they, they're washing and dressing themselves in these royal robes, and they meet Inanna here. And Inanna is attracted to Gilgamesh, based on his sort of mm, the way he looks and the way he's dressed and etc. Okay. Uh, in the epic that's in the Akkadian and Babylonian epic, she is named Ishtar. But again, as we've seen, the Inanna Ishtar overlap is the same character. So Inanna here in the first sort of 11 tablets in the epic of Gilgamesh, she tries to seduce Gilgamesh. So if you're a little bit confused, I apologize. So the epic of Gilgamesh takes place in theory as far as our dating appears, before the story I just told you about the Halupu tree, Halupu tree, although um, timeline-wise, you would think that the Halupu tree um, story comes before this epic of Gilgamesh because that story comes at the creation of the world. Anyways, so we are dealing with tablets that are written in clay, that are uh, often broken or pieces of the stories are sort of cracked out. As you know, clay is not, you know, the most sturdy um, of, of materials. And so dating them um, is based more on the cuneiform and the language uh, rather than the actual clay. To me, it would make sense either way, it, whether that story came before or after. But I just want you to see these two interesting moments for Inanna and Gilgamesh. So in the first story, he comes in, he helps her with the tree, and he leaves. Okay. And then now we have her meeting him or seeing him in the cedar forest, and she tries to seduce him. 
and asks him to become her lover, promising him all these good, good things, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Gilgamesh spurns her in this story because he says to her, you've had too many, he slut shames her basically. Yeah. He says, um, uh, oh, you've had too many lovers and all of your lovers have had a bad end. <laughs> um, all of your lovers, he says exactly, he says, your lovers have found you like a brazier which smolders in the cold. A brazier is like a, a cauldron, yeah? Uh, a backdoor which keeps out neither squall or wind or storm. A castle which crushes the garrison, pitch that blackens the bearer, a water skin that chafes the carrier. I mean, he's really insulting her. He's really slut shaming her here. Um, and he he sort of recites all of the ways that her lovers have endured miseries after being with her. Um, and he says, well, then why would I be your lover if you've done all of these things to your lovers as well? And of course, I mean, you know, Gilgamesh has some balls in, in, in insulting one of the most powerful goddesses of all time. Um, and so upon hearing this, Inanna falls into a rage and appeals to her father god Anu, okay, um, in tears over the insults that Gilgamesh has heaped upon her. But Anu does not sympathize with her. Um, and he says, well, you know, you've been messing around for so long and you've been killing all your lovers for so long. You deserve what you get. And Anu's like, what? I mean, and Inanna's like, what? No. Then she goes, uh, you're going to give me, okay, Gugalana, which is the bull of heaven, so that I can avenge myself on this doofus, on Gilgamesh, okay? If you do not give me this bull of heaven, I will break open the doors of the underworld and there will be confusion of people above and below. And I shall bring up the dead to eat food like the living and the host of the dead will outnumber the living. <sighs> like what a massive threat. So she threatens her father God that you're going to give me something. You can imagine this fight, right? Between father and daughter. You're going to give me something to get this guy back or I'm going to blow up the world. Now, the one thing that we don't talk about often is that the bull of heaven, Gugalana, is the husband of Inanna's sister, Erishkigal. Okay? So he's not just a bull. I, I have an image here of uh, Gilgamesh, you know, sort of killing the bull. And there's lots of bulls in ancient mythology that are literally bulls. And I mean, sometimes Zeus is a bull and blah, blah, blah. But Gugalana is known as the bull of heaven, but he is the husband of Ereshkigal, which will come in real importance when we look at Inanna's descent later on. Interestingly, Anu, her father, says, yeah, okay, you can have the bull of heaven. And she brings Gugalana down to the city of Uruk to destroy Gilgamesh. The bull of heaven snorts and the earth opens and a hundred young men fall down to death. With his second snort, he cracks open and 200 fall down to death. So I want you to think about not just the fact that she gets the bull of heaven to uh, wreak havoc on Gilgamesh, but that the bull of heaven cracking open from the underworld, presumably is in the underworld with Ereshkigal, his wife, coming up to Uruk to fight Gilgamesh, costs 500 men their lives. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu then join in battle with the bull of heaven and kill him. They kill him. And Inanna is enraged further, appears on the walls of Uruk and curses the heroes, prompting Enkidu to tear off the bull's right thigh and hurl it at her. This presumption on the part of a moral mortal cannot be endured by the gods, and they decree that Enkidu must die, lest more mortals come to think about trying to defy the gods or disrespect them in this way. So Enkidu is stricken with an illness and suffers for days before finally dying. And then, as we know, for those of you who have read the Epic of Gilgamesh, this really sets Gilgamesh, I mean, my theory has always been that Enkidu and Gilgamesh are lovers, of course. Um, and and Gilgamesh, you know, tears out his hair, rips off his robes. He's devastated, just like Achilles with uh, Patroclus, devastated by the um, the loss of his so-called best friend, lover, etc. And then this uh, pivots Gilgamesh into his own search for immortality, which is another story, perhaps for another day. 
Um, but what's really a great takeaway from that is that Inanna has literally demanded that the husband of her sister be brought to her, that in doing so, 500 plus men have lost their lives and that the bull of heaven is then killed. So the, the husband is killed um, and, and Enkidu is killed. So in a way, Inanna's revenge is immeasurable. I mean, a part of me go, thinks that Gilgamesh deserves what he gets because he should not have been calling her all those names. But unfortunately, the innocent, you know, the bull of heaven and uh, Enkidu are the ones that die. Um, so that makes me a little more eh, at Gilgamesh even more. I don't know why. <laughs> I still feel like Inanna is in the right here. Yeah. And so then... <laughs> This prompts us to go into the underworld. I do have this image here of the queen of the night. Okay, the reconstruction. Um, so if you're watching it on YouTube, or like I said, if you Google it, you can see that her body is colored in red. This is a polychromy reconstruction of what she would have looked like in color, uh, that her hair is black, that her wings are black, white, and red, um, and the owls around her, her horned hat is gold and red, and the lions are like a white and black. It's a really, really awesome reconstruction. And I think that if it is accurate that she appeared in this color, it's fantastically powerful. Much more powerful than the beigey white way that we see a lot of ancient pieces and artifacts that we have left. That's one of, I think that's one of the things that I cannot do. Uh, and I'm so, so glad that so many scholars are working on polychromy and others are working on polychromy because the ancient world is so fully colored. So for example, if I'm videoing or, or taking a picture of an artifact in a museum, it is often, it has often lost all of its color. And even the piece that we have, this Inanna, Ishtar, Rishkigal, Lilith piece <laughs> that we have um, is like beige, right? It's like stone colored uh, because all of the color has been drained away. And so the reconstructions and the recoloring of ancient statues is so important in accuracy because of course color is powerful but also color tells us there's meaning to color and it really uh shows us what it would have been like to really walk around the ancient world so um you can google this piece and see its polychromy color um so let's talk about her going into the underworld because I think that there are a few layers here that I would like to pause at and think about. Yeah. So the Descent of Inanna, the poem is Sumerian. Uh, it was written, or at least the, the the pieces that we have found, somewhere between 1900 and 1600 BCE. And um, it, it describes the um, experiences of Inanna, the queen of heaven going into the underworld. Yeah. So she's apparently described as the, as, as coming from sky and earth and everything that's above the underworld and going down into the underworld to visit her recently widowed sister, Erishkigal, the queen of the dead. Yeah. Um, the poem begins really famously from great above. She opened her ear to the great below from great above. The goddess opened her ear to the great below from great from the great above, Inanna opened her he her ear to the great below. Okay, but I want to summarize the story because the story is quite long. She wants to go down into the underworld, and she doesn't tell anybody. Everybody tells her this is not a good idea because you have just been a key player in Irishkagal losing her husband consort, the Bull of Heaven. She doesn't care. She dresses in her finest clothes. She puts on her crown. Right. She. It's almost like she um, she's trying, like, you know, the audacity is the words that come to mind, right? She gets super dressed up. She puts on her breastplate, her gold ring. She really, uh, some people say that the, the layers that she puts on are layers of protection because as you'll see later, she has to take layers off. And so she really sort of um, dresses herself in all of her titles and all of her strength. Okay. She gives uh, Ninus... Ninsabur instructions on how to come to her aid should she fail to return. So she already thinks that this is a really risky uh, endeavor. There are scholars that argue that she is going into the underworld to take over the underworld. 
Um, and then there are scholars that say she is going to visit her sister in the underworld. Um, I'm going to lean towards taking over the underworld because Inanna loves to take over places. She loves, loves to conquer. She is a warrior goddess. And it would make sense that at this time, when Erishkegal is alone, because the bull of heaven has just been killed, that this is a good time to pretend that you're going down for a visit and perhaps take over um, the underworld. So again, um, she shows up at the gates of the underworld and knocks loudly and demands entrance. Okay. Nettie, the chief gatekeeper, asks who she is. And when Inanna answers, I am Inanna, queen of heaven, Nettie asks why she would wish entrance to the land from which no traveler returns. And Inanna says this, because of my older sister, Erishkegal, her husband, Gugalana, the bull of heaven, has died. I have come to witness the funeral rites. Could you imagine? So she is the cause of this death. She is the cause of this. I mean, okay, one could argue Gilgamesh is the cause of this death. Yes, yes. But she is the cause of this death. And she has come to witness the funeral rites. Then, of course, Neti goes to speak to Erishkegal. And uh, Erishkegal slaps her thigh and bites her lip. Right? And she thinks about it. She took the matter into her heart and dwelt on it. She doesn't seem pleased to hear the news that her sister's at the gate. And uh, her displeasure is further noted when she tells Nettie to bolt the seven gates of the underworld against Inanna. You can imagine one gate at a time, requiring her to remove one of her royal garments at each stage. Okay, So you can imagine that Erishkegal is torn in the sense that she is... Um, it's her sister... And uh, her sister is here. So there's this there's this family reliance. But also, like, her sister is the reason why this whole funeral is happening. So she tells him to bolt at the seven gates of hell. And she tells him that Inanna must shed her clothing. So Erishkegal is already aware that Inanna is wearing power. Yeah. And so then Inanna goes into uh, the, um, goes through the seven gates. So, and gate by gate, she's stripped down. She takes down her crown, her beads, her ring, her scepter, her clothing. Okay. And then um, she shows up naked, um, which again is really interesting. It's a really interesting, um, it's, it's, it's a shedding of the above world um, powers. Inanna in this, in this space is naked and bowed low. Yeah. And so there's definitely a power dynamic that happens here between Inanna and uh, Erishkegal. And she approaches the throne. Yeah, And uh, we are told that the Anuna, the judges of the underworld, surround her and they pass judgment against her as she deserves. Then Erishkegal fastens on Inanna the eye of death. She spoke against her the word of wrath. She uttered against her the cry of guilt and struck her. And Inanna is turned into a corpse, a piece of rotting meat and hung from a hook on the wall. So Inanna received the punishment she deserves for killing um, the bull of heaven, but also I would say for, well, not that they care, but for killing Enkidu as well. Um, and then after three nights and three days um, for of waiting for Inanna, uh, Ninshibur follows the command that Inanna gives to her, goes to Enki for help. And uh, Enki gives her to Gala, or two transgender priests, yeah, neither male nor female, to aid her in returning Inanna to the earth. So they go down into the underworld. Um, they follow the specific instructions that Enki tells them, which is to attach themselves to Erishkegal. Um, and you could see that the queen of the dead, Erishkegal, is in distress, okay? That she is, she's mourning the loss of her consort. She is uh, naked. Um, her hair is out of place. She's just a mess. Okay. She is also pregnant. I forgot to mention that. Erishkegal is pregnant with the bull of heaven's child. And by the time uh, Ninchibur and the two um, gala priests go down to the underworld, Erishkegal is in labor. Okay. And so the gala priests sympathize with the queen's pains um, and, and they sort of, they, they support her. And because of that, 
uh, because of that support, Irish Goodell says, okay, I'm going to give you a gift. What gift do you want? And the two Gallup priests say, uh, we'll take that corpse <laughs> that's hanging on the hook. And Irish Goodell gives it to them, right? Uh, the gala revive Inanna with the food and water of life, and she rises from the death, from her death and uh, from her corpse. However, just like when Persephone goes down into the underworld and when others have gone down into the other world, you can't just come up of the underworld. Um, you can't just leave so easily. And in this case, someone has to be found to take its place. Okay. Um, and at first, uh, the demons try to take Ninunshubur, which Inanna loves so much. Uh, and I think I could do a whole episode on the relationship of Ninunshubur and Inanna, but not today. Um, so Inanna goes, hell no, you're not taking, you're not taking my bestie. You're not taking my mistress. And then they ask her for her sons, for Sahara and Lulal. And Inanna considers that, which is kind of interesting, uh, but says, no, you know, because they're mourning for me. Uh, and even they want her, ma her makeup artist, her beautician, uh, Kara. But Inanna says, you know, all these people, all these um, characters are mourning for me. And so they're loyal to me. And no. Then she comes upon her lover husband, Dumuzi. Okay. And she finds him. <laughs> she finds him dressed to the nines, sitting on his throne, partying. Right. And she goes, uh this my husband's not mourning me big surprise uh yeah take him <laughs> yeah. and even though the muzi appeals to utu inanna's twin brother for help uh utu transforms him into a snake to try to get him to escape which again is another fascinating piece uh the muzi is eventually caught anyways and carried to the underworld uh, as a replacement for Inanna. Now, there is a moment where Dumuzi's uh, sister, Geshtinana, volunteers to go in his place. Um, and so then you have the story where they where um, they decide to split. So Dumuzi will spend half the year in the underworld and then Geshtinana spends the other half. Um, and so we have here, actually in the dumuzi Justinana story, a kind of Demeter and Persephone prequel. Um, half of the time in the underworld, the other half of the time um, on 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 the upper world, I guess. Um, and this may explain this may be a, a a myth that explains the seasons even in for the Sumerians. So lots of overlap here, but it's not really overlap. It's um, syncretism. Syncretism is a is a is a power, power much more powerful way of thinking of it. And so we have. Th these fantastic stories of dead husbands or kings and powerful queens. I find this parallel fascinating. Um, I find it fascinating that both Inanna and Erishkigal have dead husbands, you know, their husbands die. Um, in one case, of course, the bull of heaven is is instructed to come up and help Inanna and killed. In the other way, Demuzi is thrown away into the underworld to take the place of Inanna and killed. And so I don't think that it is a small thing to imagine that in the ancient world, the consorts of goddesses were more, hmm, were sacrificed often um, for them or, yeah, for them. And there are many, I mean, I mean, maybe that's another episode I could do. There are many, many cultures around the world that sacrifice male consorts every six years, every four years, every certain amount of years. Real human males are sacrificed for the goddess. Um, yeah, maybe that should be an episode. Um, there are many, many cultures. I mean, the Minoans did it, many cultures in which lots of Mediterranean uh, village cultures would have a sacrifice of a young man, sometimes a king man, or usually a consort man, that would be um, sacrificed for the goddess. And this is a really interesting point in the stories that both Inanna and Erishkigal have their partners or their consorts um, sacrificed and that they are sort of, um, 
What's the word? Uh, not dispensable. What's the English word? There's an English word where you're easily replaceable, you know, uh, that's not coming to me right now. And so that's really fascinating to me. Um, and also the power of goddess rule. What's really also fascinating to me is here we have a story in which a queen rules the underworld. You know, Arishkigal is the queen of the underworld. There really is no king. Uh, the bull of heaven, like I said, is a consort, but he's never called king of the underworld. He's certainly no Hades. And I think that we could see how Persephone, uh, also known as mistress, also known as Despoina, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, is seen as even more powerful than Hades in actual ritual. And what I mean by that is that the Greeks really want us to believe that Hades is the king of the underworld, and he has a few stories. But in actual practice, if you look at the worship of Persephone, particularly at Eleusinian and in other places, people were so afraid of her and people had so many rituals for her in which they didn't even dare say her name. And they often call her the mistress because her name alone uh, strikes fear in the hearts of humans, um, where Hades, I think, is a is 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 a bit propaganda uh, by the Greek philosophers. And then, of course, later modern patriarchy um, to make him appear as the king in many ways. Uh, there are scholars that argue that, of course, the Persephone Hades story is just a patriarchal twist of the Ereshkigal de Muzi story, which, uh, sorry, Ereshkigal Bull of Heaven story, which is that the underworld is often ruled by a queen. And if you think about Norse mythology, for example, and you think about hell, um, hell is a woman, uh, hell is a, a female divinity. Um, that stands at the gates of the underworld. And that's much, much later, you know, 3,000 years later, maybe even 4,000 years later, because the Norse were around, you know, uh, 1,400, 1,200, 1,400. Um, and so, but there's this, there's this interesting pattern that I'm starting to see develop, and perhaps you see it too, that the underworld was ruled by a female divinity. Um, perhaps this is also why Lilith, in the Hebrew Bible and in the in the sort of Hebrew tribe for a long time plays this key role. Um, perhaps this is also why in mythology, Yahweh tries to marry off Lilith to Adam to give him or to make Adam sort of this consort of this powerful underworld goddess. Uh, in the case of Lilith, the queen of the demons. Um, and she, perhaps this is why she knows that Adam's not good enough for her, right? And goes like, who is this doofus that you've given me? You know, he doesn't even obey. In the way that Gilgamesh obeys Inanna and provides for Inanna in her garden with the hulupu tree. So I think that there's something very interesting that happens here um, that perhaps we don't, connections that perhaps we don't often talk about um, and I dare to say that perhaps the underworld has always been ruled by dark female divinities and that these female divinities are so powerful and were so influential that under patriarchy, they had to be either removed or replaced by some type of a male monster. Of course, in the case of today, for example, for Christians or other monotheists, we have the devil in hell, uh, again, hell being a female divinity in Norse mythology. Anyway, there's lots of connection there. Um, and now we have the devil, so to speak, is this half man, half goat, which is very much Pan. Um, it's very much also in Kidu before he is um, civilized. Lots and lots of imagery there um, and symbolism there that would be really interesting to connect um, perhaps in a future episode um, as the as to where that transformation may have happened. Uh, although we know why, obviously, because we moved into a stronger and stronger patriarchal system. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk about that I think um, also we don't talk about is the Jungian interpretation. Um, modern goddess worshipers and pagan worshipers today view Inanna's descent into the underworld um, as... Um, an archetypal myth of the journey as a Jungian interpretation of the archetypal myth of the journey of the individual 
that must go down into their shadow cells or into the darkness to to um, accept and reach a wholeness. And the Jungian interpretation is that Inanna dresses herself in all of the worldly possessions. So for example, for example, for all of us, we we wrap ourselves into the security of our identities, our careers, our the way that we define ourselves, and then begins to uh, pass through the seven gates uh, of the underworld and sheds those. And so there's something very much about um, shedding your own identity and becoming fully vulnerable uh, into the underworld, uh, into your darker half, and seeing your true self. And then having sort of a symbolic death, right? Um, allowing that darker self to die or no, sorry, allowing that um, pretend self, the ego self to die um, and then return is then you can return to life as Inanna has returned to life. Um, and so she, the, Inanna descends into darkness, sheds the trappings of her former self, confronts her shadow uh, and has a rebirth into a complete individual. Um, and I think that's a really wonderful interpretation, a very popular interpretation um, of the descent of Inanna and of the story of the descent of Inanna. And there's lots and lots of books out there um, that dive into the archetypes of Jung um, and into the psychology of Jung and also the writings of Joseph Campbell. Um, and so... I think those are really interesting, but I also think um, as an ancient historian that Jungian interpretation is, um, hmm, is a modern interpretation. So I have a couple of issues with Jung. Number one, uh, he was a product of his own time um, and some of the stuff that he writes is very clearly a product of his own sexism, racism, and other isms. Okay, that's fine. Um, and while he has some really genius interpretations, they are limited to his time. His um, view of the ancient world, which was always a bit elitist, in the sense that he often views ancient civilizations as less than modern civilization uh, and mythology. And I think that's why he really views mythology in this psychological archetype, archetypal way, because I don't, and even Freud does the same, they all do the same. I don't think that they really could wrap their minds around the fact that ancient cultures were much more advanced psychologically, spiritually, cosmologically, cosmologically in every way than we are we are so trapped by fundamental monotheistic values moralities especially in europe where jung and freud are of course uh, judeo-christian ideology sexism racism all of those isms create such a deeply ingrained bias that <sighs> that block that block uh, the ability of both Jung and Freud and others, all of these sort of male philosophers of their time from really understanding or appreciating the um, the fact that the hero, the hero of the story of the descent of Inanna is Erishkegel, okay? Um in the modern uh, interpretation of the tale, there is no account for the very last lines of the poems, which praise not Inanna, but Irishkigal. says, holy Irishkigal, great is your renown. Yeah. Holy Irishkigal, I sing your praises. The hero of the descent of Inanna is not Inanna. In fact, Inanna is a bit of a spoiled brat that is humbled down by Erishkegal and punished by Erishkegal. And then it is thanks to Erishkegal's kindness that she rewards uh, the two gala priests and allows them to take the corpse of Inanna, uh, of course, with the substitute, which is the Muzi. So, I mean, 
Inanna goes into journeying into the underworld to attend the funeral of her brother-in-law, uh, despite the fact that her sister says, I, I don't want you here. You have caused this death. Yeah. Um, and Inanna, once she's, you know, bare naked in the underworld, she is killed by a Rishkigal just through words. So her word of wrath and her cry of guilt. Okay. And a blow, which uh, renders Inanna into a corpse and hung up on a hook. And so, and then Inanna has to be saved. She has to be saved by uh, Ninishpur and she has to be saved by her father. And then she has to, she, she has to sacrifice two people, Demuzi and Geshtinana, to be able to get out. So Inanna is not a hero. She caused the death. She punches the door down. She gets her just desserts. She is then allowed to leave. And she sacrifices two more people to get out. So I would say that it's important that we don't take young, oh, you know, it's, hmm, how do I say this gently? Because it is important that we remember that Jung's theories, and I know this happens a lot uh, in goddess culture with archetypes. Archetypes drive me a little bit crazy, and I'm a little, I'm a little uh, anti archetypes because I think they're literally an invention of Jung. And while they have some value in psychology, especially for people who are beginning to look and do a search for themselves, and and I don't know, actually, I don't know if that's the case still because. I I blame archetypes for dividing the goddesses in categories and for making it seem like goddesses are separate. Like this is a goddess of love. This is a goddess of war. This is a goddess, blah, blah, blah. This is a goddess, blah, blah. That's a very patriarchal way of thinking. It's a very masculine way of thinking. It's categorized. It's linear. It's, um, and it's limited where goddesses, in fact, in the ancient world, like I'm, trying to say today but as you if some of you that have listened to some of my episodes in the past goddesses are poly complex they are interrelated they share qualities they stand together often um they overlap each other they collaborate um in some of the rituals you'll see two three goddesses um they blend and, they are fluid. That's another word that I like. They're fluid. Um, and I think dividing them into archetypes is um, fracturing what goddess worship is really about and fracturing what the ancients really understood, which is that a complete human is made up of a multitude of layers of divine essence. And looking at the descent of Inanna solely as this sort of dark night of the soul and surviving the dark night of the soul is limited. Um, it is not bad. Uh, I think that it's important that we practice shedding perhaps some of our identities, seeing our darker selves, embracing that self, you know, attempting to, com to completely be a whole human. But I think that it's important that we know that the hero of this story is Arishka Gal that Erishkigal is truly the, the powerhouse in this story. Um, and perhaps what we can learn from Erishkigal is that even a goddess of the underworld is compassionate, is a mother because Erishkigal is in labor. So her consort can't be there because Inanna killed him. And imagine Inanna just shows up. I cannot imagine. I totally support Erishkigal's uh bashing of Inanna here because this like the audacity right um and Erishka allows them to take the body so a lot so there's a lot of compassion here um uh, there's a kind of sisterhood here um there's a kind of karma I mean I hesitate to use that word because that's a, a word that belongs to another culture uh but there's a there's a comeuppance here for Inanna that is served that is paid for. But again, Inanna pays for it with other people's lives. Um, and so 
yeah, I don't want to harp on that for too long, but it's important that um, we understand that the importance of Inanna's resurrection, because I think that culturally that plays a key role, the descent into the underworld and the being able to come up. But it's important that we understand that the reason that all that happens is because of Arish Gagel and because of all of Inanna's helpers, that there's a community, a village around Inanna that takes care of her and that is sacrificed uh, for her. And so I guess the moral of the story for an ancient person of the descent of Inanna is maybe not so much this journey into self and wholeness, because I don't think that ancient people thought like that at all. Again, this is a very Jungian modern. Jungian was around 200 years ago. You know, I mean, he has a very modern idea. But I think it's more about consequences. That is, the consequences of your actions uh, have other consequences. And this may have been a, a, a kind of consolation and a lesson as myths tend to be for humans too, as in the sense that if the gods and heroes have such an unpredictable life, good and bad, um, then so do you, you know? And so there, there's this relativity, there's this, I mean, you're a human. So how? don't worry about your fate. <laughs> of course, your fate may be complicated. Of course, your life might be hard. Of course, unfair things or fair things might happen to you or to your loved ones. Uh, and sometimes the perpetrators don't pay the price um, because look, they happen to the gods and look, sometimes they happen to the greatest goddess of all time. Uh, she also has to pay the price for things. Um, and so we have to remember that in the ancient world, in ancient Mesopotamia, humans regarded themselves as, as working with the gods, as living among the gods, the gods lived among them not as this God in heaven that is perfect and uh, makes no mistakes and has no flaws. And so remember that Inanna lives in the city of Uruk, right? And Enki lives at Eridu and so on. So these gods are not far away beings. These gods are city beings. And even when we get to the Greco-Roman world, each village, as you see, has a different version of a god uh, that lives with them and that they they have rituals for and that they practice for. So these gods are intimate they are among us. They are. Um, they belong to us in a sense, right? Um, and so it's important that we try to remember that these stories were written 5,000 years ago and that Jung had no idea what that was like, nor I think he was even interested in studying Sumerian culture in the sense of like, let us see what that was like. Um, and so he really, his theories I think are good for healing, uh, but problematic historically speaking. So having said all that, <laughs> let's move on to uh, the, the fruit, the food of knowledge and the tree of life. Um, I do want to talk a little bit just briefly about um, this concept of food and eating leading to knowledge and also trees as being the bearers of knowledge. Um, we talked earlier about how Inanna asked her twin brother Utu to accompany her to this magical place that they call the Kur, where all these sacred plants grow. Um, and when she arrives, she wants to eat the sacred fruit of knowledge so that she can learn uh, the secrets of intimacy. And she says to Utu, you know, whatever concerns women, especially around men, I do not know. So this is in a younger age of Inanna. What concerns women such as lovemaking, I do not know. And then Utu relents and allows her to eat the fruit. And so Inanna becomes aware of the power of her own sexuality. So this is one of the interpretations of the story that we were just talking about earlier when she meets him in a bar and she's asking him, you know, I want to come to your mountain or I want to go to this place called the core, which is this magical place. And I want to learn about sexuality, particularly. And uh, at first he says, no, no, no. And then, of course, he says, yeah, okay, come. And he allows her to eat the fruit and she gains knowledge. Very clearly, very, very clearly, this is a predecessor to the story of Adam and Eve. It is a predecessor to um, the idea that Eve um, eats the fruit that gives her knowledge of her nakedness. And then, of course, Adam, who's standing next to her, also eats the fruit. And then if we look at the hulupu tree in combination to this, to this food, um, we can see, again, a predecessor of Eve. So remember that in the Garden of Eden, 
the snake comes out of the tree the, or the snake is in the tree. Presumably the snake comes around the serpent. Sorry, the serpent, because he's still a serpent at this point. And remember that in the Hulupu tree, when we're talking about Inanna standing there waiting for the Hulupu tree to bear fruit, there's this kind of overlap of fruit. Uh, a snake comes, uh, a serpent um, is in the tree and makes his home in the tree. And Gilgamesh eventually sends him away. So I want you to see the use of symbolism, repeated symbolism that would have been in the mindset of people um, in the ancient Near East or the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent. There's lots of names that this area has been given over the last couple of hundred years. Scholars keep changing different names. Um, I actually had a conversation with a colleague recently about how many times we changed this, the name of this area. Um, Mesopotamia, let's say ancient Mesopotamia, which is of course it, 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 it ancient Mesopotamia also includes places like Syria, Anatolia, Greece, other locations, and uh, the Fertile Crescent is a great sort of area to to uh, uh, identify as sort of a an original geographic location. And many people argue that it was in the Fertile Crescent that the Garden of Eden actually existed. Of course, no one has found it yet. And of course, it's unlikely it ever existed. It's a myth. Um, but this concept of the Hulupu tree or of a tree, a special tree, an almost magical tree in which a serpent and perhaps an Anuzu bird and Lilith live, right? You can see the overlap. I hope that I am clear in showing you the overlap of symbolisms um, and how they bleed into uh, the early Hebrew tribe and the early mentality or imaginations of um, those who wrote down the story of Adam and Eve. Um, the tree of life, of course, um, is the trees as you can imagine, and I think, I don't know if we, I've ever done an episode on trees, but perhaps I should, although that seems like I'd really have to do quite a bit of knowledge because trees are so fundamentally important um, and continue to fascinate us. I don't know if any of you have watched the Netflix special um, on mushrooms, which was called Fantastic Fungi, in which they talk about how, scientifically speaking, trees can recognize their offspring by their roots underground. And in fact, Trees often feed their offspring first before they feed themselves. I mean, trees are just continually fascinating. And we feel like we're discovering something new about trees all the time. But perhaps the ancients already knew this because certainly the tree symbolism in, in, in the ancient world is so, there's such a plethora, right, of tree symbolism. So we have this tree of life, Um and much of it can be attributed to the transition from food gathering uh, to production of food during the Neolithic era. And the female principle continued to exert its prominence in these feminine cults. Remember that in Neolithic and pre-Neolithic era, the fe feminine divine is the ruler of the majority of population, of human population. And much of the imagery around the female principle or female divinity is a tree or a snake or a fruit or a cave, right? Actually, there's lots. <laughs> there's lots. And the tree of life becomes the imagery, the image for fecund, fecund fertility uh, and birth mystery, uh, particularly in places where trees die and are reborn again. But all over the world, trees hold these fantastical, magical properties. So... The tree as Inanna and later Ishtar is something that makes sense. And the god, the goddess is seen as having these reproductive forces in nature or the mother of the gods of the mother of mankind. And the sacred tree embodies the goddess and is often uh, an association with her partner or son or paramour. So we have these... Um, we have these connections between trees, serpents again, are often also a phallic symbol, also a symbol of immortality, also a symbol of knowledge. And then the fruits, so, so the tree, the serpent, and the fruit that it bears, right? I mean, that's a great metaphor for life, for sort of the, the biology of male femaleness um, and fertility and birth, right? 
it's a fantastic metaphor. And so we see here the one of the earliest remnants of fruit bearing knowledge. So eating the fruit somehow gives you knowledge, in this case, sexual knowledge. The tree itself being a sacred tree, the serpent being in the tree. Um, and this idea that women possess a kind of sacred knowledge that is shared through sexuality to enlighten men. And I know that in the Garden of Eden story, Adam and Eve don't have sex until they're banned away from the Garden of Eden. Of course, this is a much later, later story. So um, the Hebrews, when they created that story, had a great deal of four stories or before stories to look at and sift through before they selected their own creation story. Um, I didn't mention this, but in the story of Gilgamesh, when Enkidu is uh, brought into the world, he is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He is an, he is a, a savage. Oh, that word sounds, no, I don't like that word. Uh, he is a, I mean, he's, he's referred to in that way as a savage, but that to me, that word is, has been too colonized. He is a primitive, he, he is a, no, even that word is too colonized. And by that, I mean that um, there's so many negative implications with that word. Um, he is wild. Okay. Maybe that word is better. He is wild. He is one with the animals. He, he runs as fast as a gazelle. He speaks to animals. Um, he is a, he represents wildness while Gilgamesh, of course, represents civilization. Um, but the person that civilizes him, that educates him, that humanizes him is, uh, Shamat. Shamat is a priestess, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A temple priestess. Uh, a, a woman who knows the ways of intimacy um, and she, he has sex with her and in having sex with her, he loses the wildness and is civilized. Okay. And then he's all pissed off because then he curses her because she took him from his wild self to civilization. And which means that then he dies uh, because civilized man dies and Kidu in his wild self is still um, immortal. And so one of the reasons, so I don't really bring up, uh, I didn't really bring that up, but I, I think it's important here because there is something, there's an old sort of tale that in having sexual intercourse with a woman, a sacred woman does change a man <laughs> and it changes him in a sense for the, the better in the civilized world, but it also costs him immortality. And I think this this very much is the forerunner for our concept that Eve somehow tempts Adam, even though Eve does not tempt Adam. Uh, he's standing right there in the story, and and we've we've gone through that story in, in in previous episodes. He's standing right there, and they don't actually have any sex or anything like that. But in the last you know thousand years, we've had the temptation of Adam or the sin of Eve. And that is, has always been sexually charged. And the implication is that somehow the seduction of Adam destroyed him. And I think a lot of that has to do with the story of Enkidu and this idea that sacred sex or sex in the temple or sex with a woman that has sacred knowledge or sex with a powerful woman <laughs> somehow... Um, both enlightens and destroys uh, the man. So I find that really fascinating. And I thought that it's important that we reach further back than the story of Genesis and we um, we we connect to that. Um, and lastly, before we move into the after the podcast, I do want to say that if you're a Patreon supporter, which I appreciate and I, I thank you so much, you guys, um, I, will, I will do a separate uh, short episode on... Um, Inanna and um, her hunt, her hunt uh, for um, Sukaletuda, who is the man that violates her. So we're going to do that in after the podcast. Um, so where am I going with that, Carla? So lastly, before after the podcast, lastly, I would like to talk about uh, 
the gala priests of Inanna and uh, how she is a goddess without binaries. And like I said at the top of this episode, it is very important in our day and age, and particularly in North America, if you're listening to me from a place outside of North America, you may feel like this may not be relevant to you, although I think it's relevant worldwide. It is important that we speak on trans issues and LGBTQ issues, and it is important that I speak on it uh, for myself, for my own life, for my own community, and for as an educator for up and coming generations. Um, here in Canada, we are having embarrassingly um, several protests that are anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ and I don't want to go into that too much in this episode, but I do, in the sense, I don't want to go into the protest and the politics of that, but I am so disappointed. I, I'm I'm really uh, happy that my students, so at the university where I work, which of course is a, um, um, a university that embraces all, all people and all humans, and I'm really proud to work here. Uh, but my students are students that are very evolved and educated. Uh, our education system is has some problems, but it's still it's still pretty good in the sense that it encompasses all humans and all human history. Um, and I'm really proud of them to bring up is these issues and to to teach them how to think analytically and how to understand the issues of human rights and all these kinds of things. Um, and I do that in my courses, but it's important, I think, for this episode and for me, and it's important for me, as you know, I've done the Gay Gods of Greece episodes, uh, which kind of ruffled some fe feathers, I think, um, which is okay. I mean, I don't make up history. I'm just presenting it to you. <laughs> uh, but um, it is important for me to present to you history. And in this way, I'm presenting to you history um, that is that has been around for 5,000 years or more. And so... Trans identity, or I would like to say non-binary identity, because gender identity is so fluid, and I think it's so natural for it to be fluid, and I think it's natural for children to explore their um, gender identity. I don't want to say that it's natural for children to explore their sexual identity in the sense of like intimacy. I don't want to get into those kinds of moralities or values. Cause again, that, that is the, the, the space of parents and parental and perhaps teachers. I don't know um, that is, you know, there, there's a, let me phrase my words. Children deserve every right to be happy, protected and innocent for as long as as you know possible um however gender identity is an expression of self for example the priests of inanna were often androgynous men uh that one could argue were transgender and by that i mean they performed they dressed up as whatever they wanted whether it was a little more leaning on women's clothing whether they took on female names, today we would call them female pronouns, whether they sang with a sort of feminine voice. This is a performance. And so to me, for example, when I was a child, one would have labeled me a tomboy, right? I mean, that's not something we say anymore. But I dressed like a boy. I did things like a boy. People always said, you're such a boy. Um, and my parents, I guess for girls, it's a little bit easier. My parents were mostly open to that. Like, I can't remember anyone, my mother ever saying to me, well, sometimes she would say things to me like I cussed a lot. <laughs> I still do. And she'd be like, girls, don't cuss. Uh, you know, again, that's a performance. And so what I'm trying to say is that when a person is young and they're experimenting with their presentation, with their clothing, with their names, with their pronouns, with uh, their crushes, um, that is part of the human experience and has been part of the human experience from the beginning, from our existence, from our, you know, 100,000 years. 
Uh, I don't want to go into, you know, people will have these arguments about, well, children are having surgery young, or I, I think that might be an American thing in the sense that I, I don't know. I have friends who are telling me, oh, you know, there's 10 year olds having surgery. And I don't know. And I don't want to speak on that because I also feel like that's a parental issue. And perhaps in that case, a legislative issues and other issues. And I don't know what the medical issue would be, for example, in the United States here, of course, children have to have the permission of parents. Um, and so those kind of decisions, just like decisions about a uh, body changing, like if a young girl wants to change her nose or her breasts or whatever, uh, and she's under 18, again, I leave that to parental, as a parent, I leave that to parental discretion or the discretion of the guardians of those individuals. But I do want to talk about gender performance, which is not a, let's say it's non-surgical, okay, for the purpose of our historical um, description. The freedom of being fluid in your gender is as old as time. That's really what I'm, what I'm trying to say and should be encouraged and celebrated because we want to achieve our highest selves. We want to uh, attain our highest selves. And also because we want to be comfortable in the bodies that we make for ourselves and in the clothing that we wear. Um, and that is a human right. So con reconnecting that back to Inanna. Inanna is a goddess that allows for the shifting of gender. And in fact, like I said before, she sometimes purposely changes the gender of her worshipers and herself and herself. I mean, like I said, she's often depicted with a beard uh, and she's often depicted wearing so-called men's clothing. Um, she was also believed to have the ability to change a person's gender. Okay. So change a man into a woman and vice versa. Lots of poetry, lots of poetry fragments. Um, show us that there were people that were that were living outside gender binaries in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, in one of the stories uh, that she, the, in her passionate Inanna, for example, uh, there's a story that says that Inanna says, is to destroy, to create, to tear out, to establish are yours, Inanna. To turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man are yours, Inanna. Okay. So it's hard to know what the original Sumerian meant. Um, this could be relating to gender stereotypes. I'm not saying that this is related to surgery. So again, I think like medical procedures are one thing, gender experimentation, changing of names, pronouns, identity is another thing. Although these two things can overlap. Um, and so there is discretion for all of that. Um Individuals that live outside of the gender binary were heavily involved with the cult of Inanna, heavily involved. So like I said, her priests were known for their androgyny and their blurring and destroying the gender binary. And this is fascinating, fascinating because her priests are celebrated. Um, and this is often included in her poetry, like I said. There's an example called the, the Pili Pili which is a group of cultic performers at Inanna Sumerian festivals. And Pili Pili is, um, is, is in reference to an individual that is transformed by Inanna. They are raised as a woman, right? Um, and then Inanna blesses them, gives them a spear as if she were a man and renames them Pili Pili. So she, she gives them, she transforms this individual. Uh, now we don't know what this transformation means exactly. Um, because Sumerians did not use gendered pronouns. So again, you know, here we have a language in which um, it's very difficult to know exactly what happened, although most scholars agree that Pili Pili was transitioned into a man. Even if Sumerians did not use gendered pronouns, uh, there's sort of this phallic connotation with the word sphere. So here is a young woman, born a woman, uh, and then transformed by Inanna by being given a spear. And some scholars believe that being given a spear may have been a phallic symbol of being given, um, in this case, a masculine genitalia. So 
There is, and this is not the only time that we see non-gendered priests to goddesses. Um, often male priests were, ca like for example, in the worship of Kaibeli, male priests were castrated and so, uh, or castrated themselves. And so this, and many other goddesses, several other goddesses have castrated priests as um as the leaders of their movements or their cultures or their communities. And this really represents this idea of ungendering yourself, non-gendering yourself, um, um, sacrificing, not just not. So it's not about chastity. It's not necessarily about not ever having sex again, uh, because you can do that without castrating yourself, but it is about ungendering yourself. Um, and in fact, some scholars will argue that castration is almost uh, a way for male priests to feminize themselves, um, to be without the phallus, you know, to be without phallic. So um, it, it's a really fascinating area. And I really hope that young scholars might take up this section and really start to dive into what's both what's already been discovered and what may be to discover further. Um like I said before, the priests of Inanna were often known as Gala. They were seen to have been created by the god Enki. They sing a bunch of laments for her. Um, and they, from the beginning of their time, they dressed um, as women. They wore women's clothing. Um, and um, so there is this discussion that... Um, they may have replaced women priestesses that were originally there so that um, Inanna may have had female priestesses at first. And then as males wanted to worship her in order to be able to worship her, they became women uh, for all intents and purposes, adopting female names, singing in uh, Sumerian female dialect um, and, and speaking sort of in, in female voices. Um, but they were heavily involved in all of the religious rites, uh, including, of course, anything from sacrifices, taking after this, looking after the sick, singing, performing elegies, all of these kinds of things. They were respected members of the community, closely related to the care of their communities. Uh, they sometimes undertook a uh, ritual castration, like we talked about with Kaibeli. Um, there isn't very much evidence of this, but there's an, an, an implication. And so... While we cannot make um, assumptions about all of this, because sometimes I think when we use the word trans, that's why I like this idea of gender f uh, fluidity. Trans is a very modern term, and it has a multiple multitude of, of connotations. And I think that people react to it in a certain way. For Inanna's priests, there were pre there were priestesses that were female. There were gala priests, of course, like I just said. Um, there were people who lived their lives fluidly. So it's possible that they were living trans lives. Uh, it's possible that there was a multitude of sexual identities and experiences. Uh, we don't know what their everyday life was like, what their partnerships may have been like. Um all we know is that they were held in high regard, that this practice went on for a thousand, two thousand years. So it was something that was deeply entrenched into Sumerian culture and later cultures. Um, and that blurring genders is something that the ancient world was very, very comfortable with. Um, and that it was not an issue of... Um, Certainly, it was not an issue of protest. It was not an issue of hatred. It was not an issue of disgust. It was not an issue of violence. I want you to think about a world in which war is a daily, well, a monthly, yearly reality. And yet, people were allowed to be gender fluid without being killed. And yet we live in a society in which men, unfortunately gentlemen, feel, some men, feel the um, entitlement to kill, torture, torment 
other human beings simply because those human beings disturb the perpetrator's idea of um, gender normalcy. And I really think that's where I have the most problem. Um, yeah, I would say um, that that is where I have the most problem. Uh, we have a we have a few um, a few stories, uh, for example, and later Assyrian versions of Inanna's descent. There's this inclusion of the Kugara, who is replaced by the Asinu, another member of Inanna's cult. Uh, and uh, the uh, the scholar Dali avoids gendering this by translating this as uh, the good looks the good looks the playboy and suggests that they may have been a boy castrated in a ritual castration. So this is an example of uh, a castrated priest. Um, but the Asinu was another feminine member of Inanna's gender blurring cult. Um, and the Babylonian poem, The Epic of Era, the Asinu, of the Asunu, a poet says, whose maleness Ishtar turned female for the awe of the people. Um, and so it is assumed that the Asunu, for example, and Kurgara represented the combined feminine and masculine aspects of Inanna in the complete spectrum of gender that she encompassed. So this is a later Assyrian story, Inanna Ishtar here being um, exchanged. Um, but again, about a about some of her priests, in which modern day scholars translate as boys, but ancient texts that we relook at again makes very clear that this is a very fluid gendered uh, priesthood. And so, what can we say about what can we say in closing about Inanna? Everything. Everything. Uh, for those of you still with me, I want to thank you for coming along on this uh, longer than expected episode, but I knew that we were going to take some time to go through it. Uh, for those of you that are that have done deep dives into the Inanna Ishtar history, um, I welcome your thoughts um, and your comments and uh particularly around concepts. Um, we don't always have to have debates over the names of things or the places and dates of things. I think that's important, but I find that well, I'm, I'm labeling that Google learning <laughs> in the sense that we can all look up things on Google and find dates and times of places. And so what I would really like for us to have conversations about, if it's possible, is concepts and interpretations. And perhaps the the importance of learning history from its most primary source so bypassing Jung, bypassing the greeks bypassing the romans bypassing all those people going all the way back to sumer and trying to understand that we are just interpreting um yes we are interpreting things that are written in stone <laughs> literally uh but those things are broken and our interpretations are based on the interpretations of interpretations of interpretations, like telephone through time. And so context is difficult to assess as fact. So what I mean by that is there are many interpretations. All of them could be true and all of them could be untrue. What's really interesting, I hope, for all of us in, in, in reaching back through time and looking at history is that maybe we can figure out not so much what the ancients believed, but how the interpretations of what the ancients believe led to what we believe. And sometimes what we believe so powerfully that we fight over it um, in the worst ways. So... If you want to come along with me on Patreon for Inanna and the Hunt for Sukaleta, please join me. It's going to be um, a really intense uh, short episode that is titled Hunting an Sayer. <laughs> so a trigger warning for all of you that are um, following me, uh, supporting me on Patreon that are coming with me. Uh, we are going to be talking about essay here and uh, revenge. 
for essay by Inanna. Uh, so if you are not a Patreon supporter, there is a QR code right here. You can just use your phone and follow me and watch all the after the podcast episodes that are available on there for our, my Patreons. Um, and uh, for those of you that uh, are not coming with me into the after the podcast, I would like to say thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for subscribing. Uh, please hit a like, a comment, please share, please rate if you're on Spotify um, or anywhere else. And please subscribe if you're on YouTube. Uh, this allows me to continue talking to you into the void <laughs> and spending uh, time uh, making these episodes for you and sharing with you, which I really enjoy doing. Um, and I hope to have more time in the future uh, in building this channel um, into a, a place where uh, we can discuss like we are discussing everything goddess related um, and um, and share in our passion for history and particularly for primary source and for interpretation of symbols of meaning. So thank you so much for being with me today. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and I will see you all next time. Have a fantastic day.